Tonight, you see the title on the screen, Respecting the Silence of the Scripture, a lesson that we've been teaching for many years, but keep going over and over it to add to what we might have learned or try to teach it as clear as we possibly can. But we want to study the lesson because we want to learn to follow what God has said rather than following what he has not said. The big question is, what does the Lord mean when he is silent? When he's not said anything on a subject that people are affirming should be uh, one way or another. Does his silence give us permission to act as we choose? Or does his silence forbid us to act as we think is best? These are the two attitudes that dominate the thinking of those who claim to be Christians and depending on which attitude we take toward the silence of the scripture, that's going to determine how we understand and how we apply the word of God, both as an individual and as a local congregation. The denominational view has long been set. God's silence is permissive. That is, unless God has specifically condemned something in the words of, you shall not call yourself a Baptist, then it's okay for me to call myself a Baptist. Or you shall not have a Baptist convention of churches uh, as in an organizational structure, then it's okay for us to have a Baptist convention of churches. God's silence is permissive. Sad to say that many churches of Christ have now adopted the same attitude as we see expressed in the denominations. We're free to do anything unless the Lord has specifically condemned it. But in the past, it hasn't always been that way among churches of Christ. Uh, The question is, what changed? What happened? Well, one of the things that has happened is, and this is an important point that I just have time to skirt over the point, but I don't do it because it's not important, but I mention it because it needs to be mentioned. But many in churches of Christ now insist that we do many things ignoring God's silence, that we go beyond the silence of the scriptures anyway, and so it doesn't matter if we add one more thing to the list, or if we add a hundred things to the list, doesn't make any difference. Tonight we're meeting in a church building. Behind me is a baptistry. On the pew, I just put down a songbook, as the rest of you did. None of those are mentioned in the Word of God. Not a single instance in the Word of God do you find any of those things that I just mentioned. But what we have is something that we don't have time to go over this evening, but what we have is that in matters of optional things that we can have, that is matters of judgment, that yes, we can have a song book. We don't have to have a song book, but even if we have a song book, As far as I know, the only thing you can do with a songbook is sing. I haven't found, I guess you could use it as a doorstop. I don't know. 
might not be that good of a doorstop. But we use the songbooks only to sing, is it right? So whatever these optional things are, you know, if I get a little warm up here, I might be tempted to dive into the baptistry. <laughs> that might be, I don't know if the water would be cool enough or it's usually warmer. But that would not be the proper use of the baptistry. So what do we do with the baptistry? Well, we use it to carry out the command of baptizing people for the remission of sin. So sometimes when people say that we do many things beyond the silence of the scriptures, what they're really getting confused about is there are optional matters of judgment that we would call expedients that we can do these things as long as we only carry out the commands that God has given. What is the scriptural view of God's silence? Is it restrictive or is it permissive? The only way that we can know anything about the will of God is that he must communicate it to us. If God does not say anything to us about something, then we have no way of knowing that this is his will. If he, ju if he hasn't communicated, then we're, we're out of uh, fortune. We don't have any way of knowing. God's silence does not authorize us to act in whatever way we please, but it restricts us. It restricts us to following what he has revealed to us. What he has revealed to us. In 1 Corinthians 2, and somebody said, well, when are you going to start reading the scripture? Well, this, this is where we stop, uh, start, and... In a few minutes, we'll stop, but we'll, we start here in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10, verses 10 and 11. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man uh, the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. In other words, unless the spirit of, the God, of God had revealed the New Testament to the apostles and prophets, we would have no way of knowing the gospel, the will of God. Just absolutely no way. It would be an impossibility because God must reveal himself to us before we can know anything about him. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, whoever, whoever speaks is to do so as one who speaks the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So if we're going to speak, we are to speak as we have the oracles of God, the King James says, the utterances of God here. In the New American Standard, we are to speak having a thus says the Lord for whatever it is that we have in mind. If we don't have a thus says the Lord for whatever we have in mind, then there's a pretty good chance that we've gone beyond the silence of the Scripture. Galatians 1 and verse 8 in Galatians 1 and verse 8, But even if we, Paul said, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. If only that verse were observed, then there wouldn't be any denominations. 
not a single one would exist because all of them are based on a different gospel. Not a single one would, would exist, none, if we only followed that example. If anybody diverts from what we have revealed to you, even if they claim to be an angel from heaven, evidently Joseph Smith, who founded the Mormon, what is it called? Church of whatever it is. It's the Mormon Church, Latter-day Saints. I don't know what happened to the early-day saints, but that's the Latter-day Saints. But if Joseph Smith had observed this, he would have never claimed that an angel spoke to him and gave him a revelation from heaven. But going beyond the silence of the Scripture, the Mormon Church has raised themselves up along with the Catholic and all the denominations going beyond what has been revealed by the apostles. The simple point is that the Lord's silence is restrictive. When we venture out into it, uh, we're going beyond what we know to be revealed. The Ark of the Covenant, it was commanded along all, with all the other furnishings of the tabernacle as they journeyed in the wilderness that those things should be wrapped in a certain way and they should be carried in a certain way by the sons of Kohath. In Numbers 4 and verse 15, when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the have finished covering the holy objects and all the furnishings of the sanctuary when the camp is set is to set out after that the sons of Kohath shall come to carry them so that they will not touch the holy objects and die these are the things in the tent of meeting which the sons of Kohath are to carry in fact, there were special poles that were made to be made and it's inserted into holes on the sides of the Ark of the Covenant which contained the Ten Commandments by which the sons of Kohath were to carry the, the Ark. In Exodus 25 and verse 13, you shall make poles of a cacai, wood, and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. And so God gave specific instructions related to the carrying of the ark. Hundreds of years later, after Jerusalem had been unified by David, he wanted to bring the ark there. And in 2 Samuel 6 and verse 3, they began the bringing of the ark there. 2 Samuel 6 and verse 3, they placed the ark of, the, of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. In verse 6, but when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out, took the ark of, touched the ark of Toward the ark of God and took hold of it. For the ox, oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him. He struck him down for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. We'll read that next verse in just a moment, but the point is that Uzzah died that day. 
because the children of Israel had ignored what God had said regarding how that they were to carry the ark. And that is the conclusion that David finally came to in 1 Chronicles 15 and verse 13. Because you did not carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us, for we did not seek him according to the ordinance. That is, we didn't follow what God said. The New Testament is just as clear when it comes to God's silence that we should not go beyond what God has said. God never required that anybody be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be a Christian. And yet that is what some Jewish Christians were trying to, were imposing upon people, especially the Gentiles. In Acts 15 and verse 1, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate uh, with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. So they go up to Jerusalem and directed by the Holy Spirit, they decide to send a letter to those churches that had been disturbed and to others who might be disturbed saying clearly that the apostles had no part or approval in any of this teaching, that they didn't command it. In verse 23 of uh, Acts 15, and they sent le this letter by them, the apostles and the brethren, who are elders to the brethren in Antioch, and Syria and Cilicia who are from the Gentiles greetings since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction have disturbed you with their words unsettling your souls in other words we didn't tell them to do any of that teaching they did it on their own they went beyond what the apostles had revealed. They did it on their own. The letter in part said in verse 28, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well, farewell. And so that was their instruction. And so since God is serious about what he has revealed, since he would not have us go beyond what he has revealed, then we always appeal to those whom we try to teach, our friends, our neighbors, whoever they may be, strangers. We appeal to not going beyond the silence of the scriptures and staying with what God has revealed. The New Testament is silent about using mechanical instruments in, in our worship. doesn't say a word about it that we should use them, no matter how popular they are, no matter how, how pleasant they may sound, uh, no matter what the crowds may draw to uh, play them and to listen to them. The New Testament instead reveals that we must sing. We must sing making melody with our hearts to the Lord in our worship. 
in Ephesians 5 and verse 19, and we have just sang tonight, and we'll sing at the end of our lesson. In Ephesians 5 and verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord. In Colossians 3 and verse 16, parallel passage, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And so since all the will of God that we know anything about in the apostles' teaching is for us to sing, and there is nothing that is said about the instrument, then we leave the instrument aside. We leave it aside. The same way is true regarding infant baptism. Somewhere in the world today, there were infants that were baptized whose parents thought that if they were not baptized, they would be lost in hell. That is, they were sprinkled or had water poured on them, calling it baptism. The New Testament is silent about commanding infant baptism. Those who can neither believe, repent, nor confess Jesus as the Son of God. But that's what the New Testament reveals, that those who do believe in Jesus, who repent of their sins, and confess Jesus as the Son of God, that they are the ones to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins, not babies. In Mark 16 and verse 16, Jesus said, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. So we must believe that he's the Son of God, that he died and was raised again from the dead, and that he's at the right hand of God in heaven, ruling over heaven and earth. In Acts 2.38, Peter said, preaching the first gospel message, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is, if we're going to be baptized, we must believe in Jesus enough to repent of our sins, turn from our wicked ways, turn to God, to submit to his will. And as was preached in the lesson, I believe last week or recently, then after the eunuch heard the message about the dying Lamb of God, Jesus foretold by Isaiah. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 37 and 38, and Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may, that is, you may be baptized. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot, he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip, as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And so we have those who believe and repent of their sins and who confess their belief in Jesus as the Son of God are the ones to be baptized, immersed in water. For the forgiveness of sins to become a Christian, no infant ever is to be baptized. Ever. But we would be less than honest if we just stopped here and ended the lesson. We don't have far to go. But we would be less than honest if we just stopped here and said, well, we've told the denominations about those things that are beyond at least some examples. We could have got, gotten given many others. But unless we look at ourselves, we would be less than honest. 
And so we choose a couple of examples among churches of Christ. And then at the end of this lesson, we appeal to looking at ourselves as well, as the congregation at Lakeview or with any congregation that we might meet. Churches of Christ funding social activities. The New Testament is silent about local churches providing entertainment, recreation, and social meals for members and the lost. That is, using church purchase property, funds, uh, facilities to provide for all types of athletic entertainment, all sorts of activities under the guise of edification and evangelism. But the New Testament says nothing about those things to be done. The New Testament says that there is a difference between individual obligations and local church obligations. That what I am authorized to do with my family and with other individual Christians, I am not authorized to do in a local church. And the New Testament reveals that when we assemble to worship, that's what we assemble for. We don't assemble to play games. I used to love to play basketball when I had some legs and when I had a little bit more strength. That is, some legs that worked a little bit. But the church is no place for a basketball arena, the church building, or any adjunct facilities. There's a difference between providing for those things on an individual level where I decide that I want to take my family to an amusement park or to a basketball game or a baseball game or I want to go with other Christians to these things but when it comes to expending the funds of the local church and providing facilities for these things, there's not a scintilla of scripture that we can find. There's just not any. And there never will be any. It doesn't look like. We, can, we, we must study and continue to study these things. So far, there has not been one. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Therefore, I, I, I'm to provide for my family whatever way that I can in an honest way, but that doesn't mean that the church can engage in various businesses that individuals might be free to engage in. The church has a, a narrow uh, spiritual focused mission. Then he says in verse 16 of 1 Timothy 5, if any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them and the church must not be burdened so that it may assist those who are widows indeed, that is, over 60 years old, do not have any family to provide for themselves, so forth, so on, as he described in previous verses there. But what is the point of all of that? The point is that if the church is not even to be burdened with providing for widows except that they don't have anyone else to provide for them, then where, where would we possibly get the idea that the church would be able to have authority to provide? Uh, that widow can come to the basketball game that we're having in the church building, but we just can't feed you. 
it doesn't make any sense. If you have a family that can feed you, you can come to the basket, you can come to our entertainment, whatever. It, the point is that the individual, the, the reason it doesn't make any sense is because the individual responsibilities are left up to the individual Christians. And the church is to be involved with those things that God has given us, the edification, the evangelism, and the caring for needy saints when family is unable to do the job that it would desire to do. There is a distinction between social and spiritual activities. We come here to worship. We come here to work together to, to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. We come here to uh, check on each other's physical needs if we need to step in again if there are no family that can help meet those needs. We come here for the purposes that God has specified that we come together. The Corinthians apparently were making a common meal out of the Lord's Supper. They were having a big time. At, at least some of the congregation was having a big time and the other people were sort of left out. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 22, uh, verse 20, Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. Paul makes it very clear. You're making a mockery out of the Lord's Supper. It's, not, it's a memorial to remember the death of Jesus, examining yourselves to see if you are wanting to live according to the new covenant in Christ, looking forward to his coming again. And then he says, after he says that, that to them, in verse 33 of 1 Corinthians 11, So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. And the remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Paul makes it very clear. There's a distinction between social and spiritual activities. And between individual and congregational activities. And when we blur those lines, then we're, we go off the rails and we go in any direction that that we believe, we feel is good. The denominations have long since started down that road. They are far ahead and have, a, uh, have been doing that for quite a while. The New Testament finally is silent about a third party, that is a local church or a, an organization between churches who are supporting preachers and those preachers who would receive that support. That is, there are churches who claim that please send your money to us and we will distribute that to evangelists in India. We will distribute it to whatever country they are trying to rule over by becoming the overseers of the work of many local churches. So they are a middleman between the giving churches and the receiving preachers. The New Testament reveals that the only time local churches sent money directly to other local churches was to help the needy saints in the receiving churches. That is, when we hear about somebody in need, we have the authority to send money that the individual families and that local congregation cannot help the 
situation enough, then we have the authority to send benevolent aid directly to those congregations. The New Testament reveals local churches sent money directly to preachers. There was no one else involved. Romans 15 and verse 25, But now I am going, Paul said, to Jerusalem serving the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. That is, that's why they were sending money to Jerusalem. Not, not so Jerusalem could run a big program ruling over all the other churches, but to help needy saints there who could not help themselves. And finally, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 8. Paul said, I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. And when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything, I kept myself, I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. That is, Paul received directly the support from those churches. There was no intervention or supervision of anybody. If God had intended it to be that way, he would have revealed it to us, but he did not. As you look at the summary slide, I know I've taken a little time, but I just try to make it as clear as I can, but... Just because we say that we don't be, go beyond the scriptures does not guarantee that we do so, that we are. And so even here at Lakeview, then we ought to be willing and we ought to be ready and desirous of always looking at whatever someone would like to study so that we can evaluate our practice in light of the word of God. And when we think we're above evaluating our practice be in light of the word of God, then we are ripe. If we have not already, we are ripe to go beyond the silence of the scripture. Maybe there's someone listening to this tonight or maybe listening to in the future that you thought you had already become a Christian by infant baptism or by the sinner's prayer, neither is mentioned in the word of God. If you are here tonight, then follow what the scriptures teach to become a child of God. If you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, are willing to repent of your sins and turn to God, then confess him before men tonight or as soon as possible as you hear this lesson. And be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You will be raised up by the power of grace, God's grace through your obedient faith in Jesus to walk in newness of life. And those who are already Christians, let us be willing always to repent and pray and turn to the Lord that we might be forgiven of our sins, that we might grow in his grace and his knowledge. If anyone is subject to the gospel invitation, we would encourage you to respond. As now we draw our lesson to a close, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?